Welcome to the Quiero.com Spanish Property Podcast, where we interview people who recently purchased a home in Spain. They tell us what worked, what didn't, and what they'd do differently next time. I'm Beth Davison, and today I'm speaking with Nikki from Braintree, who, along with her husband, purchased a house in Galera, Granada. Despite not being huge risk takers, Nikki was enticed by the idea of early retirement, and in the end, went for a property that was completely different to what they had in England. They worked with estate agent Spanish Inland Properties to find their dream home in Spain. Check out the show notes at quiero.com forward slash podcast to find links and resources mentioned in this episode. I'm Nikki. Um, my job before our Spanish adventure was as a digital manager for a marketing agency. Um, and we came to Spain and we bought a three-bedroomed cave house in the Granada province. Lovely. And how long ago was it that these conversations first started? Well, um, we didn't know Spain at all, um, and my sister had bought a cave house as a holiday home uh, about three or four years ago, and she kept wanting us to come out and visit. And obviously, the the usual, we only had 20-odd days holiday a year with work, so we kept putting it off. Mm. Um, And one Christmas during shutdown, we said, well, we know that would be the only time we could come. So we, we flew out on Christmas night and arrived very late. And on Boxing Day, we were walking around the village, and uh, my sister sort of had a throwaway comment of saying, you do realise if you gave everything up in England, um, you could both retire early and come and have a simple life out here. To which we both said, really? <laughs> and um, although we were really, really happy in England, we had good jobs, we had uh, a lovely house, great friends, great family. Um, we never saw that we could really retire much before I don't know, 75 or so. We had no plan, really. We just always thought we'd be working Mm. forever. So the thought of being able to retire, for me, sort of uh, before before I was 50 and my husband, who was in his early 50s, um, seemed like quite a nice nice opportunity. Yeah. And obviously to get sunshine and, and, and a new opportunity. So, yeah. And a bold opportunity. If you never really knew Spain that well, this is not a traditional thing to do. (laughs) What did people think when you were telling them? How did that go down? (laughs) Everyone was horrified. Um, All our friends and family were shocked. I think they thought it was a joke because, because as I said, everything, we we were both also very steady people. So, you know, we would always, we weren't huge risk takers. We might do things spontaneously, but we would never take a huge risk. And everybody knew as well for me, particularly that I had never, ever wanted to live anywhere other than sort of the town in the area that we lived in England. So although my husband would have liked to have lived abroad, um, I had no intention of that and he needed me to do all the orchestrating. So it was never going to happen. Yeah. But yes, everyone was really shocked when we told them. But it sounds like it's been a great choice. So when you say, was it financially it gave you all of these opportunities because it's better, you get more for your euro, as it were? Yeah, yes, exactly. So the, the cost, of what we're living in in Spain was a tenth of the cost of our house in England. So, mm. yeah, straight away, <laughs> I think that answers a lot, really, that obviously you're then mortgage-free. Um, and then in our, in, in our situation, we, we bought a flat um, with, the, with the proceeds, some of the proceeds of the sale of our property. And in doing that, we live off the rental income wow, um, from the flat in the UK. So, yeah, and then also you always have a have a foothold in the UK, albeit yeah. a flat, you've got something to go back to should you ever change your mind. Not that we think we will. <laughs> no, but it's great. You've kind of left your options open. So, OK, you have the conversations and you yeah. decide to make this big change. What is then the next step? Yeah. What did you guys do? So, literally, as soon as we finished that walk, and as I said, we'd literally only been here for a few hours, <laughs> Um, and we're trying not to look at rose, true rose tinted glasses. We, uh, my husband used my sister's iPad back at her cave house and sort of just started looking through um, Spanish Inland Properties website um, and said, well, really, because we like open plan living and lots of cave houses aren't open plan, um, this really seems to be the only one that suits us. So we sort of found one. Um, tried to get hold of the keys to view it which was um, sort of slightly difficult because it was Christmas time Um, and then we got the keys spent 10 minutes in it because um, the person who was showing us the keys uh, through the house was actually a neighbour 
Um, and he had to go out <laughs> in 10 minutes' time. So we just flew round, had a camera reach, um, and just photographed everything in sight so that we could look back at photos to, to remember everything. Yeah. Um, and then put some offers in. And I think the, the second or third offer, we came to an agreement with the sellers. So. That's incredible. So it was it was so quick. And was this the only house you saw? Was this the only one you bothered viewing? Uh, it was pretty much because we sort of decided on it. But then we spoke to Sean at Spanish Inland and said, um, look, rather than rush in too much, is there anything else? And he said, well, actually, with your criteria and your budget, no, not at the moment, really. So he said, the only other one is this other one. He said, I'll take you to see that just so you know. So so we did see one other, which was sort of a backup plan, but but not really. It was the craziest thing we've ever done. Um, but it's paid off. Yes, definitely paid off, definitely. Uh, within two weeks of arriving here, um, to sort of try everything out, we were already just smitten and just said, we couldn't imagine going back to England now. And that was just within two weeks. And we weren't sure if that was a honeymoon period, but clearly not because it's been longer than that now. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, what did we like about the house? It, it, again, completely the opposite to anything we would have gone for in England. In England, we always had new builds. We'd have three houses in England, all of which were new builds. Um, nothing old about them. You know, I guess most people would say soulless, <laughs> just square rooms, flat everything, and then suddenly we moved to a cave, which is almost a bit country cottagey um, and not our style at all, but we just absolutely love it. So I think it, it's just very different from anything else you've lived in. And then obviously the views, because we're looking out at Spanish mountainside as opposed to a town on a housing estate in England, albeit a nice housing estate. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, it's a complete change of life. Yeah, completely different. And it's a village. I always or I would never ever want to live in a village because I'm a townie <laughs> so really the opposite to anything I ever thought I would do and uh, so your sister you said her place was a holiday home yeah yeah so yeah she that's comes right. over and so you have company from kind of family coming over in the holidays and other than that are you kind of making friends in the community yes definitely it, I mean it's strange actually because my sister and I um there's quite a big age difference between us and we we haven't really ever lived it's a bit weird, but we haven't really ever lived together um, other than when I was a very young child and she was a, you know, an, an old sister, so I don't remember much of that. So it's strange that having never, we were sort of 180 miles apart in England, all of a sudden we're in the same village from time to time when she's out on holiday. So yeah, that, that's strange. But yes, as you said, we've met um, lots of people really here. There's There's a good English community, however... We really didn't want to come to somewhere that was Brits abroad. Yeah. Um, we wanted to come to, you know, the real Spain, if you like. So we love the fact that it's entirely Spanish and entirely Spanish looking. And, you know, we have lots of Spanish friends now. But also, you do also have lots of English friends and the support of the English community and, you know, English um, neighbours and other people in the village have been just brilliant with advice before we came you know by email even though we didn't really know anybody um and also that's the same with, with spanish inland properties um they're in estate agents but nothing like one in england so you know during the process of purchase and well beyond um sean at spanish inland is there to give us any advice or help that we need yeah and um, so that's been that's been a real godsend you know you, you couldn't really do it without that sort of network I mean you could but it would be a lot harder yeah completely and because you guys were completely new to this situation and yeah, yeah. Just kind of, <laughs> and doing things very quickly and you needed that support but it sounds like it really worked and it really came through was it an easier process than you were expecting yes yeah, far easier and give um both ends you know in England we basically had eight months to to go from from zero to suddenly selling our house and being essentially homeless and buying a flat in England and buying a cave house and working our notices at work and trying to hand over to new people taking over our roles. So yeah, that 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 side of it was was a lot of work to do, but easier. But this, the cave house buying in Spain was incredibly easy. I couldn't believe it was far easier than buying a property in England. Mm. Um, really, really straightforward. And then um, with Sean at Spanish Inland, he um, 
he sorted everything out for us remotely with, uh, with the exception of the completion but I think even for completion you, you can give power of attorney uh, I'm not entirely sure but yes yeah, so Sean sorted out opening a bank account getting our sort of national identification numbers Spanish uh, sort of like a national insurance equivalent yeah um, so he sorted all of that for us so all we had to do was for completion we just flew over um two working days before so that we could then spend two working days completing on the sale um, and again Sean just drives you everywhere he drives you to the bank he drives you to the police station he then drives you to the notary where us and the sellers um, our respective lawyers and the notary sort of we all sit around a table very very civilized they explain everything to you make sure that you've understood exactly what it is you're buying um, and then the sale takes place. But it was just just incredibly easy to buy. Really, really easy. <laughs> Fantastic. Were there any hiccups or anything that you'd kind of do differently next time? Um, no, not in terms of the purchase. The only thing that I would do differently, and certainly for people coming from other countries, especially the UK, I don't know, um, yeah, and probably any other European country, is um, the car situation. So whether to bring a car from England or buy one here, yeah. Um, I would certainly sort of research that element. And if you've got a good car in England, we, my husband and I had cars that were not suitable for Spain. Um, so we definitely had to sell our cars. So we did that and just bought a cheap and cheerful to come over. But cars here are really expensive in Spain. Um, and also um, the secondhand market, sort of the, the newly new is virtually non-existent. So that's one thing I would say to someone in England to sort of research that side of it and seriously consider bringing their car across if they've got a car that they're very happy with. Right. To do that because, um, yeah, the car's quite a challenge. Which I suppose isn't something you think about. You've got so much else on your plate to kind of be figuring out. Exactly, exactly. So that's just sort of, yeah, things like you think, you'd, as you said, um, you'd think the car, the house purchase would be possibly more of a complex element than whether to bring a car across or not. But, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. And so because you're now living there permanently, but you do have this flat in England, will you kind of do it in reverse and use the flat as a holiday home and come back? Or have you got tenants in there permanently? And for you, England, you're just you're not really back in England ever. Uh, no, yeah, the, the um, we have to have tenants in the flat. So we couldn't really afford to do this without having tenants in the flat mm-hmm. um, because that, that's not the income that we live off. So, so we really need that. So you no, know, when we go back to England, it, it's purely to just see friends and family um, and, yeah, with, with no intention of being there. When we originally came, we had thought in an ideal world it would be nice to do sort of six months in each. Yeah. Um, but actually, once you're here and you're really in with the community and, um, you know, we go salsa dancing three times a week and have we, we have a, a life here, it, it's actually quite a disruption to go back to England. Yeah, of course, I can imagine. So the six months there and six months here wouldn't really work. So, yeah, and presumably, have you got people visiting you? Yeah, we've had friends and family and neighbours from England um, coming to visit. So, yeah, we've had that. And then when we go to England, <laughs> I have a spreadsheet of everybody that we have to cram in and I sort of time it like a military operation so that I work out <laughs> geographically where to see people. And we have two-hour slots here, there and everywhere. Oh, well um, done, you. And everyone's desperately trying to see us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So, but it's lovely. Lovely. We've discovered that all our friends seem to have beautiful spare guest rooms, so that's very, very nice. Yeah, great. That's what you need. That's perfect. And we didn't talk about budget, but what was your initial budget and did you manage to stick to it when you were initially looking? Yeah, that was quite easy. So um, because obviously this idea came from nowhere, we just sort of crudely worked out on a calculator what we thought we were worth, if you like, in, in terms of sterling and worked out how long we thought our money would last. So we came to a budget based on that. And the budget was um, at the time um, 70,000 euros, which was, was at the time was sort of just over 50,000 pounds. Mm-hmm. So that was the budget. And then you have to factor in costs, which are about 10% of the purchase price because you've got to pay um, tax and legals. Um, but yeah, it was really, really easy to stick to the budget because it was, do we want to have this opportunity, try this now and retire Good God, I don't know, 25, earlier, 25 years earlier than we thought we would. Yeah. Or 
or not, you know, so that's your choice. So based on that, yeah, it was really, really easy to stick to the budget. Fantastic. And you get so much more for your money. I can completely see what you're saying with a budget like that. It opens up so many possibilities. Yeah. For, you know, under £50,000, we had a three double bedroom cave house with two shower rooms and large living area. So where we came from, you know, you couldn't get, well, you can't buy anything really from where we came from for less than £150,000. So no, you get a, nice that would be a very good nice basis. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. The south of England is not cheap. <laughs> no, not at all. And I mean, I was going to say, what are the kind of central pieces of advice that you would give to someone, maybe just sort of sitting on the fence of if they want to change their life in the way that you've changed yours? Because it's a brave thing to do, what you did. Yeah, I, I, I would actually just say just do it. I think one of the good things that we did was that we didn't think too much about it and research it because normally I research things even the tiniest purchase to the nth degree and you know it becomes my specialist subject so I think it was good that we just thought look we can't think about this let's just do it it's completely mad but let's just do it worst case we do have a backup plan you know worst case we go back to England we live in the flat which is you know a third of the third of the cost of what our house was so we know that we can and and paid for so we know we can manage that we would then have to find jobs although my employer said you know that they would always have a job for me so you know we would have to do that so yes of course you have a a backup plan but in, in essentially just do it because had we thought about it and had we researched it more we wouldn't have done it whereas um we're so so incredibly happy bear in mind we were happy in England um, we're just incredibly happy in Spain and we just couldn't imagine it any other way now and just think, wow, what a fabulous opportunity. But I think that's really, that really be my advice is not to do too much research, to do some and make sure that, you know, you're not caught short. And I, like everybody said, I think it's good to have something back in the UK. Um, yeah, it sounds like you were the perfect balance of kind of sensible and brave and crazy. <laughs> and and it all worked out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, we didn't even have a farewell party. Everyone was saying, oh, you've got to have a farewell party. And I said, don't be ridiculous. We could be back in six months. You know, I I didn't expect it to work because it was so dramatic and so different. And everyone was really, apparently really worried about how I would get on here because they knew what a great life I had in England Mm. to suddenly be moving to this village in in, inland rural Spain. Um, they they just couldn't see that that I would get on with it, and yet yeah, yeah, we just absolutely love it. In case I haven't said that fifty times already. <laughs> no, but I'm so pleased. It's so nice. I can hear in your voice how much you love it, and you are one of the few people that I've spoken to who who really didn't do years or months of research. Um, and it's I think it's inspiring. I think what you did is amazing, and I'm really glad that it's paid off. Yeah, no, it definitely has paid off. And my final question is. Um, I mean, you could probably give me a list as long as my arm, but what is your favourite part of Spanish culture and living in Spain? What What are the best bits for you? Ah, OK. So I think the pace of life. Um, somebody said before we came here that it would, they said um, it would be like going back 50 years in England, but, you know, but you'll wish you did it sooner sort of thing. So, yeah, the pace of life is um, certainly in, in inland Spain very, very, very slow. We love it, you know, with the, the siesta time and the shop shutting and that. It takes some getting used to, but it, it's not a problem. You just get used to it. And then you love the fact that the shop shut for a period and and that. Um, the people, um, I'd only been to Spain when I was 18 with the college for a holiday for a couple of weeks. So we knew nothing about Spain. Um, and we're big fans of the Far East and find people in the Far East are really warm. And, and it's quite hard to replicate that. But the Spanish people have just been incredibly friendly and welcoming and include you know including us when they don't need to um and and of course the weather so i i love the weather in england everybody moans about it but you know that it never it never it never was a problem for me i still love the weather but when you get here and it really is water all blue sky and sunshine most days um yeah it's fabulous i can imagine you've missed some snow no, we've missed snow. Although we have unusually had rain, but um, <laughs> even that, we know we need. And the rest of the time, you'll have blue sky and sunshine. But 
Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a fan of hot weather either. So for me to have loved it here, I, I never ever wanted to live in a hot country because I didn't like the hot weather. But you soon get used to it and you soon learn to love it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't have to convince me. Well, I'm glad it's gone so well and I'm glad that you love it so much. I um, I think that's yeah, it for me. You. That's all of my questions. Thank you so much for talking to me. Lovely and it's such an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Nikki. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening and thanks to Nikki for sharing her experiences along with Spanish Inland Properties for their help to make this episode possible. I love the bravery that Nikki and her husband had in their decision to buy and that she surprised all her friends and family when she eventually took the plunge. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. This podcast is produced by Quiero.com and our mission is to connect you with estate agents and properties throughout Spain. Whether your dream home is a rustic farmhouse surrounded by olive groves or a lock-up-and-leave apartment on the seafront, you'll find everything you need at Quiero.com. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. It helps us reach and connect more people with their dream home in Spain. And whenever you're ready, here are four ways we can help you. Ask a question by emailing beth at chiero.com. We'll try and answer them all in an upcoming Q&A episode. Get a location guide also by emailing beth at chiero.com. We'll reply with the latest data and information on the areas you're interested in. Calculate your budget. Simply visit chiero.com forward slash budget, enter two numbers, and you're done. Be our guest. If you've already purchased your home in Spain, we would love you to share your story on the podcast. Just email beth at chiero.com and we'll take it from there. Next week, I speak with Hilary from Harpenden, who bought his property in Iznacha, Cordoba. With former stables now converted into guest bedrooms, Hillary's property is a far cry from what he was originally going to buy in the UK countryside. Tune in to find out how much further his money could go in Spain. I'm Beth Davison, and you've been listening to the Quiero.com Spanish Property Podcast. I'll see you next week.